It's wonderful to be here at UNAM, at uh, Museo Universitario del Chopo. Mauricio has provided a marvelous catalytic spark for our conversation for this extraordinary series. He said uh, in an email priming the pump for our discussion that he had been thinking about Theodore Adorno's famous and controversial assertion to write poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. And this corrodes even the knowledge of why it has become impossible to write poetry today. And Mauricio wonders, how will we write not only poetry, but also fiction, science fictional plague of COVID-19? What are the responsibilities of writers, of we as writers in the face of the global disaster that the pandemic has wrought? And um, do we come to grips with that in grassroots political activism or on the page in imaginary worlds. I'd, I'm um, going to be uncharacteristically contrarian um, and play devil's advocate. And I will say that it seems to me that poetry and especially speculative fiction, which Naif is well-versed in, um, is, is more necessary than ever. And um, J.G. Ballard, the British author of speculative fiction, to my mind, is our Virgil leading our way into um, cognitive cartography in this moment. He said in his introduction to the 1974 French edition of Crash, we live in a world ruled by fictions of every kind, mass merchandising, advertising, politics conducted as a branch of advertising, the instant translation of science and technology into popular imagery, the increasing blurring and intermingling of identities within the realm of consumer goods, which we certainly see on social media and in conspiracy theories like QAnon, the prompting of any free or original imaginative response to experience by the television screen. We live inside an enormous novel. For the writer in particular, it is less and less necessary for him to invent the fictional content of his novel. The fiction is already there. The writer's task is to invent the reality. To both of you as novelists, um, do you say amen to that sermon or are you uh, utterly unpersuaded by Ballard's perspective? Do we in fact live in a surrealist novel? Is the world more science fictional by the minute? And is it our job as writers to conjure a sane uh, alternative? Um, or does the surreality, the novelistic, the fabulistic, the magical realist nature of everyday reality dispossess us of our basic imaginative tools and leave us completely bewildered as creative intellects? Either one of you dive in. Well, I, I tend to agree with J.G. Ballard. And uh, as soon as you gave us, as you remind us of that quote on the prologue or introduction of his uh, great novel, Crash, I, I, I went to reread 
that introduction. And yes, I think um, I agree with another uh, colleague of us, another writer who said uh, some years ago that Ballard um, started as a kind of futuristic or a kind of a prophet and then turned into the best chronicle of our present. And I agree with that assertion uh, by this uh, Argentinian author. And uh, yes, I think that we're now facing so much fiction in our everyday lives. I mean, the COVID-19 pandemic is all science fiction. It's like a, a like like a like a like a science fiction novel of from uh, not very good writer, <laughs> I, I, I must say, because it's, you know, it's absurd, it's full of gaps, it's mm -hmm. full of holes, it lacks continuity, it lacks uh, human depth somehow. And uh, we as, as writers have to reinvent, not only invent, but reinvent our reality. Um, at the start of this um, bad, uh, clumsy science fiction novel that we're living in, March 2020, I started to think what was I going to do as a writer facing the, uh, the, the global uh, cataclysmic landscape that we were facing, that, that we are facing, that we are still facing. So uh, what, what I did uh, um, uh, to answer my own question was to do the best thing or at least one of the best things that I, that I do that is to write, to start writing. Um, uh, what I wrote, the first of three or four books that I wrote in during 2020 was a short novel that I haven't intended to write in any stage of my life that, and that suddenly came to me like, uh, like a bolt on lightning from the uh, inspirational sky. If, if, if you can say that. And it is a novel that doesn't have to do, a short novel or a, a, a novel uh, that doesn't have to do exactly with uh, COVID-19 because I think that we have to, you know, let the present um, coalesce and make a sediment in ourselves before we started writing about our present. I, I, I always think that the novels that uh, address the immediate present tend to be bad novels because, you know, reality needs to be sedimented in the mm -hmm. author. So what I wrote was a novel that had to do with, obviously, death and the death landscape that I am with all the rest of the world. Uh, was living and experimenting day after day, hour after hour. And uh, that was my, my uh, at least my first um, step to face the new reality or the new normality, I will call it the new abnormality that we're going to face from the, I mean, from here to eternity because COVID-19 has been, has, has uh, turned, the, the history of mankind into two has like slashed the history of, of humankind in two hemispheres. Mm -hmm. That was uh, before COVID and after COVID, like BC and AC. And what was, you know, for our listeners, what was the title of the novel? The title of the novel is The Funeral. And it, it, it's, I, I will not uh, um, take much time talking about this. Um, but it has to do, it's a, it's a funny thing that happened with this novel because uh, uh, many, about two years ago, I, uh, I was uh, uh, a reader of mine, uh, an Instagram reader, emailed me uh, telling me that she had acquired, she's a woman living, she's a Mexican woman living in Italy, in, in, in Turin and married to an Italian man and that she got uh, to buy a whole album of old pictures of a funeral mm. in some part of Italy, maybe uh, according to the attires and the automobiles that you can see in, the, in some of the pictures. 
I guess it's from the 1950s, uh, in the 1950s. So I was like, yes, I'm interested in, in getting this, this album, this photo album and doing something with it. But as I said before, uh, the work of the writer needs to be sedimented. The present of the writer needs to be sedimented. So it got me two years to start writing something uh, starting from these pictures or basing what I wanted to write in these pictures. And it was a, a, an incredible, really um, fulfilling experience. One of the most satisfying, I must say, in my writing career, because I, I got into, well, what us fiction writers do, got into another people's story, but these people actually existed. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in Italy, somewhere during the 1950s. So I, I got the opportunity to reinvent the life and death of some of these characters that appeared in, I selected, it was a photo album comprised of maybe 50 pictures. I selected like maybe 25, 30. And I decided to, to tell the story behind each one of the pictures. So that's the funeral. It sounds like the, the photo album in question was uh, T.S. Eliot's objective correlative to your inner emotional life. You found a symbol, an outworld that was almost allegorical or a surrealist metaphor for the COVID pandemic. Absolutely, because actually what it's quite uh, darkly ironic, many were mostly banned around the world. So this whole procession made during the 1950s somewhere in Italy was like a, actually a thing from the past. And actually I was starting to think that funerals as we get to know them, you know, being at a funeral parlor or being in a procession in like in, in this small Italian town were a thing of the past. I hope that in the future we, we will be able to, to regain this, um, for me, necessary contact with our death. It's quite odd to think about the death of death, uh, you know, at the, risk yes. of, at the risk of sounding like a, uh, a daily affirmation or a decoupage plaque uh, mission statement, you know, <laughs> wow, that's profound. Um, but, but there is something odd about the notion of funeral processions and, and graveside rituals expiring. And it's also doubly odd that this scrapbook, which is a virtual book of the dead, um, comes washing up on your shore at just the right moment, you know, yeah. for you to transform it, or as Freud would say, cathect it with psychic energy. And Naif, um, the same question to you, whether as a novelist or a cultural critic, and certainly as a spelunker in the nethermost depths of the science fiction imaginary, um, does the surrealistic nature of the moment we live in Ballard's proverbial enormous novel that we're all now uh, inhabiting, right? Living this surreality. Does that dispossess you of the ability to imagine um, liberatory or transgressive or repressive fantasies? Does it steal the, the words right out of your mouth in the sense that any dystopia you might conjure is going to pale in comparison to the multifactorial or hydra-headed horror of our moment. I mean, we've got Trump, we've got the QAnon uh, shaman, you know, howling in the Senate chamber as if he's going to smear the walls with his feces. You've got uh, Oath Keeper militiamen thundering through the Capitol, howling for Mike Pence's head and uh, threatening to string up Nancy Pelosi. And they came within, you know, a, a minute or two of doing so. It's not pretty to imagine what would have happened if these white supremacists had gotten their hands on um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Mondaire Jones or any black or brown member of our Congress. So, and then you've got the air is thick with conspiracy theory. You've got a pandemic straight out of the Andromeda strain, you know, or Day of the Triffids or, you know, pick your dystopian viral horror. You know, Richard Preston's The Hot Zone is written like a science fiction novel. So you can invert these things, sci-fi that reads as 
uh, sober scientific uh, prognostication or, or, or um, uh, science fiction or, or uh, scientific uh, speculation that reads as SF. So for you, um, is this the moment you were born to inhabit or are you experiencing a kind of a peculiar epistemological vertigo because reality is more fictional than the fiction you write? Wow. Wow. <laughs> very, very loaded, incredibly loaded. Anyway, just first, uh, thank you, Pacho, for having us here. This is such a privilege. This is such a, always such an amazing thing to be back in my university, my alma mater. And um, and uh, just saying this also because I need more time to digest every every single word that you said, Mark, which is so complicated uh, to to express for me, because as you say, yes, for me, first of all, the uh, the the reading reading a ballad for me was transformative, was the the most influential thing that happened in my in my literary life. I mean, he made me a writer. He is the one who really. Gave me gave me the need to 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 say things, and uh, and still crash for me is probably my best my favorite book, um, and and living through this moment is is exactly as you say it's it's an, on one side intoxicating and fantastic terrorizing I mean just taken from the point of view of the writer of somebody who has to do something with your reality and turn it into literature uh, uh, express something of value out of all, all this. Human experience and human misery—it's—it's it's a terrifying feeling for me. And um, I was—I I think I, we had a conversation a while ago when I was telling you that I, I had been writing this this book of uh, short stories about the apocalypse, about different different kind of apocalypses. So there is, these are number of of, uh, of short stories telling different ways in which something is going to end. I mean, so I have the end of the water, the end of sex, the end of love, the end of relationships, the end of gender. So I was mm -hmm. having fun with this and I've worked with this for a long, long time. I believe it's maybe between the first one and the last one, probably there are seven years, the seven years apart. And then suddenly this happens. So in one, on one hand, is you don't even know if, it's, if this is the merchandise opportunity of your life <laughs> or this is the end of your career. What, what, <laughs> what is it? I don't know. And, and I feel like that because um, for me, the pandemic has been on one hand, a free fall, this, this, this free fall into a dystopia. And on the other side, this slow grinding of the, of the machinery into this way of stopping. And, you know, I really like that Mauricio was saying this was, this is a real pandemic, this is a real science fiction that we're, that, that somebody really bad, a really bad writer concocted for us, a really bad um, evil demiurge as was th thinking. And I think that you're right, but, but also I will say, well, but wait, maybe this guy is like a Stephen King and we are just in page 300 of a 975 pages book. So who knows what the hell is coming? So I, I don't know this, this, uh, this sensation that we have been living, like, like Mark said, uh, it's not only the pandemic, it's everything that's going with it. I mean, the, the, the colossal um, uh, political crisis, the, 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 the whole process of ele the electoral process with, with a char character as Trump, turning everything into these Buffon-esque, uh, 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 I don't know, like grotesque uh, field of uh, everything saturated, every emotion, every, every thought. There's nothing that happens in isolation. We don't have time to think of anything. The obscene in every sense has invaded the scene, right? Everything that was supposed to be kept outside for for many reasons, it's now inside, and, it, and it's 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 colonializing our minds. You know, for me, one of the most important phrases was um, with um, Ballard uh, talked about the, the 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 real horror as this uh, suburb of the spirit, right? This place where nothing happens, when forever you're gonna be uh, in this stagnation of the intellect. And what happened was uh, as the kind of the opposite. We are in not in the suburb of the spirit. We are in the in the slums of the spirit, where everything is happening on top of us, and we don't have anywhere to 
to go run because if we go to the even to the bathroom, the grandmother and the and the sister and the and the cousins are already there. We don't have anywhere to go. We have been we have been taken. Everything has been taken over. And um, and another little thing that I would like to add is Mauricio. For for you and I also we talk about this this the COVID thing as this as this um, break at this point in that, that separates and and after COVID uh, before COVID and after COVID time and and it's uh, and it's a cyclical thing because because the, if if there is any certainty in life is that germs are there to get us. I mean, they have just given us some chance. I mean, they just gave us a little bit of leeway. Like, okay, I'm going to give you a hundred years. Let's see what you can do in this hundred years. Let, let's see if you, humanity, can think about what's coming to get you. And of course, we were so disregarding of the threat that we didn't prepare anything, but with the exception of the Vietnamese, the Taiwanese, and the North Korean and some other people who said, okay, this is serious. Even the Africans, most of yeah. the African sub-Saharans, they understood, okay, this is serious. We're not gonna fuck around with the masks or with the dis distancing. And uh, for, but for the rest of the, of, the, of the world, well, we are just paying our dues. Well, it's a, that, that is absolutely fascinating, Naif. And, and uh, please claim your airtime. I don't want to cut you off. I feel that both of us have uh, hogged the spotlight entirely too much. Um, but you inspired several thoughts in me. One of them is um, when you talk about the virus, um, we're, we're thinking our way in this conversation toward, among many other things, the particular trajectory this part of the conversation has taken is the notion of science fiction, SF, as an explanatory narrative that is the best episteme epistemological fit for our moment, and perhaps even ontological fit. What Ballard, who is quickly becoming a spectral presence in this conversation, the, the fourth discussant, um, what he would call myths of the next five minutes. And um, Ballard would probably point out that the virus itself is science fictional in the way that all viruses are science fictional. That is to say that COVID is a non-human life form. And it's kind of thumbing its nose at the Anthropocene. It seems to resonate with de the sort of decentered post-human or non-human philosophies that are getting traction uh, these days like object-oriented ontology, panpsychism, and the Lovecraftian cosmic pessimism of Eugene Thacker. Um, and he's thoughtful on the point that in Lovecraft's cosmos, um, the gods are not so much malign as indifferent. In fact, S.T. Joshi, the Lovecraft biographer, says that Lovecraft's philosophy is, is rightly termed indifferentism. It's an implacable um, cosmos whose frame of reference is so orthogonal, so utterly apart from ours, that it barely takes notice of us. And that I was uh, struck by the fact that viruses are uncanny things in the true Freudian sense of the word. I mean, Freud in his essay on the uncanny talks about cadavers, waxworks, um, as things that hover between taxonomies, they hover between epistemic categories. You know, thing and person, alive or dead, they disrupt those philosophical binaries, those hierarchical dualisms in a way that destabilizes them and is very unsettling for Western epistemology or ontology. And I believe viruses do the same things in the same thing in the sense that they hover between life form and biological machine. And there's a lot of debate in the scientific world about whether they're a form of life or they're or quote unquote organisms at the edge of life or self-assembling organic molecules. And also the bizarre way in which these, I believe they're called, uh, I believe COVID is what Mike Davis in his book, Monster at the Door, calls a zoonos, which is a 
of a, a self-replicating machine that leaps the species barrier, right? So COVID went from bats to pangolins to humans. You cannot make this stuff up. I mean, this is, this is you know, far better than the, the best John Wyndham uh, disaster novel, you know. So, so do, does either of you have any thoughts on the virus itself as always already science fictional? I was thinking that, uh, well, as Nath just said, actually viruses have been living with us in this planet way before us humans started walking this scorched earth. And uh, they were before us. They were here before us. So it's like they were say, they are saying now, you know, you guys move over because we were here before you. We were going to be after you. We were going to all outlive you. So this is just a small, another small taste of our power and of our presence in this, in this planet. And then I started thinking about that uh, many viruses. The, 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 the funny thing about, for example, technology is how we started talking about viruses relating to technology, right? We're afraid we're installing antiviruses in our computers, afraid that they, those viruses can you know, endanger our information or work in the computer. So we have been living, but we haven't acknowledged that fully, I think, with viruses for the whole of our lives since we are born. Right. Then we, we started thinking that technology could grant us like uh, some kind of power over many things. And that's not true. That's not true because, uh, because uh, also in technology, we are exposed to viruses and strange pandemics, strange invisible pandemics that are lurking in the, in the World Wide Web. Right. So um, let, let me uh, just give an example of, of, of my interest in pandemics. Um, about eight years ago, my God, eight years ago, yeah, um, I, I wrote uh, a novel that was part of a more uh, of, a, of, a, of a bigger pro narrative project that I started writing on Twitter. And, and the title was? Um, the title was, the, the, well, The Men in Tweet. It's my, my, the project that I started writing on Twitter, the narrative project that I'm, that I'm talking about was called The Men, the Men in Tweet. And uh, in any case, uh, the, the novel or the narrative project um, is uh, divided in four parts. I haven't written yet the fourth and last part, but the third part is what I'm going to talk about because that third part is about a pandemic of beauty in uh, what I like to call a simultaneous Venice because it's not the Venice that we know or it is, but also is the Venice of the, of the Middle Ages, of, of the Renaissance, and maybe a futuristic Venice. So it's a Venice that where many times or, or yeah, many times uh, conflate or, or get together in that, in that Venice. And uh, I started thinking, well, we always think of, of, of pandemics of being of related, re, relate pandemics or, or yeah, link them with ugliness, with putrefaction, with uh, all the queer death, of course, etc. And then I started asking myself, well, what, what will become of, of us humans if a pandemic gave us beauty mm. instead of ugliness? Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about this pandemic that starts as um, a kind of um, Stendhal's syndrome that became physical or physiological and starts with a woman watching a work of art in one of Venice's, Venice's many museums and she gets infected with beauty. And then she starts spreading beauty all over Venice <laughs> and uh, all the, yeah, the infected look actually quite beautiful because they start 
transforming into different characters of different works of art. So all Venice is like plagued with, plagued with this beauty pandemic, but also plagued with beautiful dead bodies. So it was in any case, I, 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 I imagined that, as I said, eight years ago in 2012, and, and then when the um, COVID-19 pandemic started, and we started seeing all these strangely beautiful images of almost Ballardian vacant cities from all over the world where nature started like, you know, uh, uh, started taking their ter its territory again. And then some of the images that I, some of the photographs taken in this vacant deserted Venice that I saw last year, actually were some were images that I started to imagine eight years ago. Like what, what will Venice like this Disney life of the Adriatic look like when it's all deserted, when it's all vacant, when, it look, when it's all empty. So in any case, what, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to, to, to do here is not to promote my work, <laughs> but, but to- Although we don't, we don't frown on product <laughs> placement, Mauricio. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm yeah, trying to say- Better bookstores everywhere. <laughs> okay. Maybe what I'm trying to say is that the writer always has maybe shorter antenna to somehow capture the like radio waves that are, you know, in the atmosphere, so to speak. Hmm. And uh, the thing is, well, for me was uncanny, just as you were saying a few minutes ago about the, the uncanniness of our world, how the, the familiar is turning into something absolutely sinister and macabre. And uh, that was for me writing this, uh, this novel, this novel about the pandemic of beauty, uh, of turning a city that I, that I really loved, that I had been there, and uh, um, turned it into something sinister, but also something beautifully sinister or macabrely beautiful, as you will say, uh, as you uh, can see it. That is absolutely enthralling. That's deep and rich and stirs up so much sediment in the riverbed of my mind. Um, I There are a thousand things I could say, but I want uh, dear Naif to have his time at the microphone. And, and so just to hark back to the, the question I asked that precipitated this, this extraordinary response from Mauricio, uh, just in case it, it got lost, Naif, um, I was curious to know if it's at all generative for you to think about the virus as um, the non-human phylum's sharp rebuke to the Anthropocene, you know, and, and the virus as uh, either a machine life form, as Manuel Delanda says in War in the Age of uh, Intelligent Machines, borrowing from Deleuze, the, the machinic phylum, mm -hmm. right? Machines considered as a tax, as sort of a Linnaean taxonomy, mm -hmm. or, or if not uh, using the machinic metaphor, um, a sort of a virulent, a malevolent, implacable a life form mm. that is, you know, John Carpenter's The Thing. It's, it's out to get us. It's got our number and the, <laughs> the age of man in the sense of anthropos, humankind, is uh, well and truly over. And this thing, this black ooze, this uh, creature whose only desire is to replicate and colonize hosts so that it can make more of itself, like Agent Smith in the burly brawl mm -hmm. in the Matrix, uh, mm -hmm. reloaded. I, I'm simply curious to know, given your broad and vastly deep um, knowledge of SF, of film, and of speculative literature more generally, um, if any of this sparks associative trails in your mind. Oh, definitely. Um, you know, for me, it's very, very interesting, and and, and absolutely, I, I think it's a, it's a beast of science fiction. It's a it's a monstrosity that has that, that really evades the characterizations, the usual way we stigmatize the 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 the, 
the, the, the uncanny, as you said, I think that that's a very good way to, to refer to it. I mean, this, this thing, is, as you mentioned, is, not, is neither alive, neither dead. It's, uh, it's so small that it's not even a, it's not even a bacteria. It, it, it can ride into a bacteria, into very high, high organisms. It can, it can go into anything and transform whatever it touches. I mean, it's a perfect uh, metaphoric monster. You know, if we, if we think that the basic, uh, the basic idea of horror is the destruction of the body or the decomposition of the body or the transformation of the body. Well, this is the perfect machine to do so. It's, it's such, a, such a beautiful thing and a, such an atrocious thing at the same time. Uh, such a simple, simple thing. And, and we can say, well, it's just, it's just uh, some freaking DNA that, that has this, this uh, properties and it's just another machine, right? But, but then you see that these machines are also very unpredictable. When you see the history of, of, of other pandemics, how the influenza, right? For example, and at a time where nobody really knew what the virus was. Virus uh, was a, a recently discovered thing at that point. Most of the people had no idea. They, they still thought it was, okay, a microorganism, like a, like a bacteria, but not, they couldn't understand the complexity and the simplicity of something that is just a strand of DNA or a collection of strands of DNA with, in this, in our case with the coronavirus, armed with spikes to be, to be able of, to enter the, the fortress of the body, to, to, gr to gr grip and, and shred. It's such a fantastic thing and so incomprehensible. I mean, many of the, of the, of the times when you have viral disease, I mean, they attack and suddenly either they disappear magically as a strong predictor <laughs> or in our case, we have no idea what's going to happen. I mean, sometimes I think, well, we're doing well with the vaccine and that's a very, very fantastic uh, progress in technology, how, they, how fast they managed to create not one, but a bunch of vaccines that they um, uh, fortify each other in the sense that the, the technology of one proves that the other technology is good. I mean, that they are on good mm -hmm. scientific grounds, which I don't think that has ever happened in life. This is amazing. We have science at its best and still, and still very un, un, unprepared and unarmed to face this monstrosity. And, um, and uh, I, I am always thrilled when, when, when I think of this thing, which kills some, but not that many. And many of the anti-pandemic uh, anti people, the people who don't believe that the pandemic exists, they say, oh, it only kills the what, 0.2%, 0.1%, whatever. And you say, yeah, yeah, that, that still makes a lot of people, a lot of people that shouldn't be dying. Well, if, the, if, the, if, the, if your father or mother or brother or wife you know, or husband is within that two percent. Uh, <laughs> then it becomes it suddenly becomes very concerning. Or exactly, if you're, if you're the one on the ventilator, yes, then, then it's and dying. You know, behind uh, you know glass while your family presses its noses against it. You know, waving their last. Um, it suddenly becomes a rather more pressing question. <laughs> exactly, exactly, it, it, and that's the thing, and. Uh, and uh, what what it's uh, amazing is that this thing who has no mind has a mind of its own because it has a strategy. It develops uh, uh, all these uh, mutations. I mean, you can say, of course, but it's biology, simple bi biology. Well, if we go to that extent, we can say that human beings do, do a lot of things or simple biology. So so we might have to to extend the the idea of strategy of 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 critical thinking <laughs> to our our brothers and sisters in the virus world but let's let's move now to the political question i mean this is an age ruled by memes it's ruled by viruses and um 
the author's name eludes me, but the marvelous book, Kill All Normies, about the rise of the alt-right, talks about the weaponization of irony and the use of memes as a highly effective um, sociopathological way of spreading viruses of the mind. And Trump is a creature of 4chan and 8chan, although he's surely never been on either, but they embraced him in instantly. They were in ecstasies the night he was elected and they, they said it better than any. We have elected a troll in chief. And now memes are part of mainstream political discourse, the memification, if you will, of the way that the cultural conversation is conducted is irreversible in America. And I'm curious to know, is there a Mexican correlative to this? For me, the meme was a, a, a very strange operation. When I first heard about the meme, the Dawkins idea of this uh, cultural self-replicating, uh, contagious kind of idea that goes around and spreads all over. I thought it was a really fantastic thing, a really uh, enriching way to grab what's go what was going on in culture with a minimal effort. Effort, And then, and then uh, things took a very different course, as, as we have seen with everything else in, in the internet. We, we have a phenomena, we expect something and something completely different happens. This has been the, the norm. So uh, basically when, when I speak now about memes, especially with my kids who are in their 20s, their, their immediate response is, you don't know nothing about memes. You have no idea what you're talking about. You are, you're completely ignorant. You try to rush, rationalize and you're falling completely behind. You, you, don't, you, you cannot grab the, the importance, intensity, the significance for our generation of a meme. And, and I, I, I believe they might be, they might be right. I think, I think that the idea of the meme, yes, it's a, it's a very contagious uh, way of spreading things that they're easily imitated. But also, I think that they, that for us who are, for us, especially me, who are, who is, I'm very, very old. I was very young when the pandemic started. And now I am really, really old. Uh, it, it, I, I, I can't grab of, of all the potential. For example, let me, let me try to, I'm going to evade the, the discussion about Mexican politics for a little while and just go into the 90s. The, the, and, and Mark, and, 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 and I'm sure Marisa too, you, you must remember when we had um, th this boom of optimism, I mean, and it was very present in the publications that we despise and but we follow religiously, like Wired, the Wired magazine. And also, Monday two thousand, in its own way, was very cybertopian. Very yes, very exactly. very uh, Rebecca of Sunnybrook form, very Pollyanna-ish. Yeah, I remember. I remember very, very uh, vividly, and I still have it. Uh, too bad I didn't get it out of my collection. There was this issue of, of Wired saying everything is going to be so great, so deal with it. That was the basic idea. We we are going to be so fucking rich and so fucking happy. You have no idea how great this is going to be. This was completely Trumpian before Trump. Yeah, the, the winning, the winning will never end. The winning, the, it will never end because winning, we you can't stand it. Because we just stroke this mind, this 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 vein of a mind where that it keeps on giving without us giving anything. Because that was the model of of the cyber culture, right? You yeah. don't have to pay for anything anymore. People are gonna provide all the culture you need for nothing, and that started generating all this all these memes and all these uh, elements that became part of our culture that now we, we assume are real. And then by the 2000, 2001, I will say, everything started going downhill. And now we are living into this other side of the, of the, the catastrophe, right? Now everything is so negative. I mean, we are, I mean, we have really to be very brave to stand up every, to, to get up out of the bed every morning because everything is messed up. Yeah. We, we destroyed everything. I mean, the, the, the pandemic, if we see it clearly, the pandemic is nothing compared with what's coming with, the, with global warming in, in, in a very near future. 
This is just giving us um, an idea of you want to be confined. Well, you're going to have to be confined because you're going to you. There's no going to not going to be any way that you're going to be outside because first of all, there's going to be nothing outside other than I don't know zombies eating brains. <laughs> or, 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 or I don't know, predators or whatever, uh, and nothing to buy, nothing to do. Now, now that we have been forced into this confinement, it's very interesting to see, and, and to see how the media, the, 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 the social media has been cutting with it. I mean, in, in one way, it's been saving us from, from craziness. I mean, we, we've been already in since, since March, so, uh, we have been dealing with these the atrocities because we have these screens, because we have something to entertain us, to, 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 to make us think that, yeah, this is, this is a funny element too. This is a cultural element, but, but the reality is that it's very, very um, worrisome. I, 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 at one point, I remember we were talking, Mauricio and I, about these things. And that's when I said, nothing's gonna be the same ever ever. <laughs> it was a very uh, traumatic moment. So part of this never is going to be the same is, is this simplification that I was making fun at the beginning of when I was speaking. Everything is going to be simplified, divided until getting to the minimum denominator. And the meme is that. The meme is that thing that, that, uh, that simplifies, that, that, uh, that that cuts all the all the richness of the conversation and turns it into a funny image with some crazy texts, uh, which, in many ways, Marcus, you will uh, you know much better than me. It uh, it comes in a way from Dada, goes through the surreal surrealists, and then it turns it into this malevolent being. That's <laughs> that's uh, that's taking over our culture. And just to finish very quickly, to go back to the to your question about this, wh where are the QAnons in Mexico and, and everywhere else? I think I think they are there. They are they're growing. They're 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 simmering. They are growing tentacles everywhere. For me, you know, when, since I heard the first time about the QAnon a while ago. I was fascinated. Um, another thing, I speak to this about with my with my daughter, with two, you know, her twenties, and for her, this, this is like the most boring and and and, and unproductive way of thinking. Is she's like, why do you even devote your time to this? Because they are so easily grasped. Everything that they say is in in bold, huge Trumpian letters. There is no mystery. There is no magic. There is no enchantment even you know mark remember when we used to have these fan scenes and we will go to 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 st marks or in paris we'll go to the quartier latin to get this this underground magazines that they divulge all this crazy stuff about sects and cults and and all the the the, the underworld right there was this underworld which was uh, terrifying fascinating and everything and now nothing of that sort exists. We have the, 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 the QAnon, which you can dissect in 15 minutes in a couple of websites. And, and that's about it. The magic of their, of their cult is so superficial, so boring, but at the same time, is very threatening and very, and very real and spreads. I mean, I was seeing these manifestations, these demonstrations, I'm seeing, I mean, of uh, QAnon people in Austria, in Vienna. And you say how? How did they? How did they got into this thing of believing Trump is some kind of deity, god, godlike figure that's going to protect us from the pedophiles and the and the cannibals from Hollywood? And um, it's a it's a very interesting way of of seeding uh, to to the to the less interesting, to the less educated, to the more ignorant. And uh, there is no no um, there's no vaccine for that. I see it spreading. I see it growing. And uh, I mean, what happened in the January six with the with the with the assault to the or the storm to follow their wording of the Capitol, is was just a prologue. I am very afraid, not because the real violence is going to come, but because this is going to become us. This is going to become what we are, what we have to deal with. The stupidity of the year, of the Bush years, of the Re Reagan years, is going to look like like Olympic, like magnificent. 
what is the place of the artist both in the landscape of social media, uh, Mauricio is someone who attempted to write a Twitter novel. I would be curious to know how one writes a Twitter novel, what inspired the very idea of a Twitter novel, and whether, and this is utterly unrelated to the first part of the question, whether both of you anathematize social media to the extent that I do, even though I'm on all of these platforms. <laughs> Um, but they are they they are social leprosy to me. They make my skin creep, um, and I I look at myself in the epistemological mirror of these platforms, and I'm unrecognizable to myself. I don't like what I see. It's Seth Brundle in The Fly, you know, gazing into the bathroom mirror and and you know staggering back at the horror he beholds. So. Whichever of you wants to dive in first. So uh, I ran away from Facebook, but I, I must say that in every um, social media platform that I have been in, I, I have written uh, literary projects. For me, social media was and still is, I'm only right now on Instagram. Uh, for me has been, uh, they, they are like, like, uh, like notebooks. Like, um, yeah, even like, though, but may I interrupt Mauricio, even though yeah. you're writing in public, because that always seems um, like uh, this uh, Renaissance anatomical textbook image of the flayed man, right? The, the decorticated man often depicted as the Saint Bartholomew, I think it was, I mean, you guys. Mm -hmm come from mm -hmm. Catholic culture, you would know better than this old atheist. But the, the saint who was flayed alive and is often depicted in 15th century woodcuts, jauntily throwing his skin over his shoulder, as I always like to think as Frank Sinatra with his raincoat on the cover of Songs for Swimming <laughs> in the Rivers. <laughs> but, but the point is that if you're writing in public, isn't that like someone sitting down at a typewriter in the middle of a sports arena filled with football fans? I mean, how can you do it? Well, because for me, uh, it's, it, it sounds, I know, contradictory what I'm going to say, but for me, I have found um, an enormous freedom and liberty on social media until now for writing my literary projects. Because as I said, I know that there are public, you know, as, as I said, like a public arena for uh, exposing your work. But in any case, for me, I, I mean, I really, truly don't give a shit about what people think about what I write on or don't write on social media. For me, it's an experiment, has been an experiment of, yeah, like, like opening, so to speak, my studio, my, my writing laboratory to the public. How do, you keep, how do you keep the story in your head if you're writing tweet by tweet? I mean, I, I, real, I noticed, I couldn't help but notice in your biography, you said that you were working on, uh, forgive my abysmal uh, Spanish pronunciation, El Hombre de Tweed, yeah. um, for something like five years. And, and, and it, it occurred to me, of course it was that because you're, you're writing 140 character installations. How did you hold all of that in your head? As I said, I left Facebook and then got uh, on this black hole they call Twitter. And I, 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 I was there for about I whole years of my life. I spent nine whole years of my life on, on, on this black, in this black hole. So for me at the start, it was very easy. Uh, I, um, as I said, I, I'm talking about uh, paradoxes and, and contradictions, but for me, the one uh, at, at the start, let, let us, let us uh, remember that it started as, as a, on Twitter, I mean, 140 character limit. Then it doubled to 280 character, and I think that's the limit uh, nowadays. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I found, as I said, I found an enormous, uh, 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 an enormous freedom in constraints. I really like to think that these small 140 character cages of, of, of writing uh, provided enormous creative freedom, at least that was for me. It's very ulipo. It's very like the French that's, uh, that's it. Uh, literature potential movement. Yeah. 
that constrains itself by saying, write a novel without using vowels or, you know, write a novel in which every sentence begins with A or whatever it may be. It's these arbitrary constraints that turn out to be what the philosopher, uh, cognitive philosopher Daniel Dennett calls inspiration pumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, it was, uh, uh, for me, it was, as I said, very, very easy. And you asked how I, I managed to get it, to get in my head the whole idea, to, to, to not lose the thread or the narrative thread of the story. So as I, as I said at the start of our conversation, the, the Man in Tweed uh, narrative project comprises of three parts, right? Like, a, like a, right now for, of three parts, I, I'm, tr I'm planning to write a fourth and last part, not on Twitter anymore. But uh, the, the three first parts of this project, I, I wrote them on Twitter. And the first one, it was a whole Ulipo experiment because I, I wrote that first part directly on real time on Twitter. So I started uh, every day for a month because that, that took a month of, 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 of my life, of my writing life. And every day I, got, I, I started with an idea of, of to, to continue the last part, the last chapter I wrote the day before. And then I started like, you know, going with the flow of the, of the story, almost like, a, yeah, like a surrealist thing. Art, For me, it was, writing. Yeah, like automatic writing, but never or trying not to lose the narrative thread of what, what, what I was writing. And then uh, that was the first part that I wrote in a whole month on real time from Monday to Sunday, never missing a day. It was like a discipline for me. And then when I, when I uh, realized that, that, I, that I had a novel, that I had a, a whole, a, a bigger project in my, in my hands, then I started writing first on uh, a Word document and then started like doing the cut and paste on, on Twitter, but never losing the idea of writing 140 character installments. Mm. That was the challenge for me of, of writing like these small chapters of 140 characters. Wow. So for, for, for me, it was, it was really fun. It, I, I know it sounds obsessive. It was, <laughs> I, I am obsessive. Uh, it sounds neurotic also. I am a neurotic, so it was a neurotic <laughs> project. And, um, but it was also a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun writing these projects. I, I will never do something like this again because I this that was this project on Twitter. Now uh, I, I ran away from from I escaped from what I called cheater, not Twitter because it, it has turned into a, a, a global cheater, mm -hmm. and uh, um, took uh, refuge in on Instagram. And there I'm writing another couple of, pro of literary projects that I hope that someday will be uh, published that spark the interest of some publisher in the, in the maybe near future. So we have to wrap up now and I wanna return us to the very beginning and we begin with the Ballard phrase, we all live in an, inside an enormous novel. And so let me quickly ask each of you very briefly, what novel or movie best resonates with our moment for you, provides the best explanatory narrative, um, which whether it's a work of speculative fiction or a work of Gothic fiction or a film or a TV series, which myth of the next five minutes shines a light around the bend to whatever lies ahead for good or ill or is most closely mapped onto the topos of our moment. Is it a work from the past, like The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick, a classic like 1984 by Orwell, The Road by Cormac McCarthy, a disaster novel like The Drowned World or The Drought by Ballard, uh, Mao Tu or White Noise by DeLillo, maybe Kim Stanley Robinson's Cly Fi, Lovecraft's Racist Gothic, uh, the TV series The Walking Dead, um, or films, um, like I'm thinking of ending things, um, or um, the marvelous uh, sort of black gothic of noir of, of us. Um, uh, just whatever, uh, you know, for you maps most closely onto our moment. Um, 
it's uh, it's very hard to say. Um, I think of the Drown World by Ballard. I think of uh, uh, oh boy, the one with the skyscraper of ba Ballard's um, High Rise. Uh, high Rise. I think about High Rise about like uh, those things that socially uh, he portrays so well. I think about Running Wild, also by Ballard, the one about the suburb. Well, not the suburb, the, the gated yeah, community, yeah. where they where they steal the children. I think that those give me a lot of of, um, of elements that I can grab to to understand the moment we're living, and also the movie uh, Perfect Sense by David Mackenzie, 2011, which I think it's a marvelous piece and a, and a completely neglected masterpiece. Um, I think it's uh, it reflects. Uh, all our anxieties about the pandemic and, and where it's really taking us. Uh, for me, I, I have two, two novels that I read in the past year. The first one is the newest novel by Don DeLillo, The Silence, that uh, tells in no more than 100 pages uh, the possibility of a uh, technological apocalypse mm -hmm. where all devices stop working altogether. And this, there's, uh, there are two couples that are in the novel that face this technological apocalypse that starts on an airplane. And for me, it's, uh, it's one of the most extraordinary proofs, not only of one of the greatest writers alive, that's Don DeLillo, but also of the possibilities of the future for uh, us authors of fiction. And the other one is a novel that I uh, just read, uh, I finished reading yesterday. And it's a novel by an Italian author that wasn't uh, published uh, during his lifetime. He actually, this novel called Dissipatio HG, it has a really strange Latin title. It's like Dissipations of All Humankind, of All Human Genre. Uh, human genre, yeah, uh, it's like Dissipatio humanis, gener humanis Generis. And it was published posthumously in 1977, but it was the seventh novel by Guido Morselli, that's the name of the author. And uh, after he sent this novel to uh, a publisher in Italy, Mondadori, uh, and it was rejected, he committed suicide oh. because he faced the failure of a, a lifetime after after sending seven novels, this was the last one, to different publishers, they didn't get interested in publishing it. And afterwards, as sometimes happens in literary life, it, 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 uh, he, Guido Morselli, I mean, became one of the most, or has become one of the most important Italian writers of the post-war years. And this novel is a post-apocalyptic novel written in 1973, the same year that Ballard published Crash, actually. And it, uh, it tells the story of only one last man standing. And that's the narrator, the unnamed narrator of the novel that tells the tale of how to survive in an empty world or, or a world empty of all, human, of all human beings. And it's an extraordinary novel. And uh, I'm, I'm watching for the fourth time, the first season of one of my favorite TV series, that's True Detective. That's the one set in Louisiana. And I agree each time that I have seen this, that I have watched this series, I agree more and more with the Matthew McConaughey character, with his nihilism, with his absolute uh, uh, lack of faith in humankind, in human nature and in everything. But at the end of this, of this fantastic season, there's a small glimmer of hope after all this darkness that we have been facing through all the season. And I would like to, to finish this, 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 my, this, this intervention by saying that, yes, I'm, I'm like the uh, Matthew McConaughey character, not by, by my looks, obviously, but by, by the way of of thinking about uh, uh, being very pessimistic about human nature right now. But for me, there's this small glimmer of hope at the end of the uh, tunnel. 
marvelous. What a perfect note to end on. I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen for being so inexhaustibly fascinating and um, reliably eloquent. I'd like to also express our collective gratitude to UNAM and our hosts at the Museo del Chopo and uh, to all of our Mexican listeners who I hope found this uh, enlightening and entertaining in equal measure. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Nave. Thank you, Mauricio. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Pacho. Thank you to the Museo del Chopo for everything. Thank you.